Hello, and welcome to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we challenge, encourage, and equip Christian women just like you to be all in in faith and family. Today on the podcast, we are speaking with Hannah Keeley, America's number one mom coach and author of the book, Mom Fog, Eight Steps to Overcoming Mom Fatigue. On today's podcast, we are talking about something that Christian women and all women deal with all of the time, and that is that mom brain where you just don't have the clarity, you feel distracted, you can't pay attention, and everything just feels kind of foggy. If you've ever felt that way before, trust me, you are not alone, and you're definitely going to want to listen to today's interview where Hannah and I talk about what mom fog is, what causes it, and several tips that you can take today to help you improve your mental clarity so that you can be the mom God created you to be. All right. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us today. Will you start by just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do for moms specifically? Totally. Brittany, this is a pleasure. I am so excited to be talking with you today. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Hannah Keeley. I'm America's number one mom coach. And that's what I do. I coach moms and also train up life coaches. And I do it with a clear throat sometimes, but I also (laughs) do it with a faith perspective. Everything is really um, biblically based for what I do because I've seen such dramatic effects by just going with Um, doing what God says, as opposed to like going by my clever ideas. So everything I do and everything uh, we go by inside uh, Mom Master University, inside the Mom Fog Challenge is all faith-based because that's where you really get the results. Awesome. So I know that you have a book about Mom Fog. Can you tell us a little bit, just really briefly, what this book is and what it's about before we dive into this whole topic? Oh, totally. Absolutely. I'm so excited about this. My book is called Mom Fog and it's all based on mom fatigue syndrome. It's actually a phenomenon that happens with moms. And I mean, you tell me, Brittany, have you ever like walked into a room and you're like, what was I doing in here? Like, okay, well, let me go back and try to remember what I was doing. Or maybe your kid's talking to you and you're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And you have no recollection of what they said. Or you just do something, you're like, what happened to my brain? Like the time, you know, a couple weeks ago when I drove out of the Starbucks parking lot with my latte on top of the car. And it was a venti. (laughs) It was a venti. But so these kind of things just totally blow our minds. We're like, what is wrong with me? Like, I was somewhat normal before I had kids. And now I'm totally flying by the seat of my pants, clueless no idea what's going on. And we say, oh, I've got attention deficit, or I just have, I'm just really tired, or, um, you know, I'm just waiting for my life to get back to normal. And the thing is, it doesn't get back to normal. And so a lot of it is based on, it's actually a lot of what I do is I take science, I combine it with God's word, and we get like just amazing results in our life. So it's all about how to get out of that, what causes it, and how to really create the life that you desire. Well, I love this idea of mom fog syndrome because I feel like it puts a name to something that so many of us deal with on a regular basis. I know that you have a quiz on your website where people can go, and we'll link that in the show notes as well, um, but where people can go and take the quiz. And I did this this morning of, okay, how many symptoms of mom fog do I have? And some of them I was like, yup. And some of them I was like, well, thankfully not these ones. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think it's something that so many of us take for granted that, oh, this is normal. Oh, we have children. Oh, we're busy with work. Oh, we have this. So it only makes sense that we don't have this mental clarity. Well, I mean, you know, we can write it off to being normal and it actually is, it is normal, but that doesn't mean we have to be powerless to do anything about it. What happens, and just to make all moms feel like they're not losing their mind, that is totally normal. There was actually a research study that was done and they did MRIs on women before they had babies and then after they had babies. It was actually a longitudinal study, so it went a very long time. And they found there was a decrease in gray matter in your brain after you have a baby. (laughs) And I'll explain why this happens. But the thing is, it doesn't get back to normal. The, in this longitudinal study, they were like, you know, they looked at them like months later, years later, and they still had 
the loss of the gray matter in their brain. And so you're thinking, all right, why would God in his loving mercy, <laughs> when I need it most, make my brain literally shrink? But what happens is we develop almost like this sixth sense. Like, have you ever... Um, have you ever like just known something was wrong with your kid? Like maybe, you know, your middle school daughter, you're like, no, nope, something's bothering you. Like, let's talk about this. Everyone else is like, you know, your husband's like, oh, she looks fine to me, but you just know something's wrong. Or like those moments when you just grab your toddler right before he runs out in the parking lot. It's something, you just sense it, like something's not right. And we have this protective instinct that allows us to really, um, unfilter our environment we're able to take in so much more of our environment um, as opposed to before we had children we couldn't and so that's why you're like i can't even focus now it's kind of true because you're taking in so much stimuli from outside your environment and it's this sense that god gives you and so if your brain was like you know this beautiful louis vuitton bag right and you can only put so much in there like it's a quality bag but still it can only hold so much and so when you know you have to allocate more resources to just observing your environment and like perking up on that sixth sense, some things are, you know, you have to let go of, like leaving your coffee on top of the car or getting distracted by things. And it's just kind of a balance of where your brain is now that you have a whole new set of skills that are required to raise a kid. And so what I do in my book is I walk you through, it's called the Mom Mastery Method. It's basically an eight-step method of how to get your focus back and how to use this amazing sense that God gave you to um, really increase the quality of your life instead of decreasing it. That sounds very helpful. I want us to take a step back though and ask, okay, so it's great to know that it is normal to an extent that we have this mom fog. I know that I deal with it sometimes too, like there is too much going on, I cannot even focus. <laughs> but how do we know when we have reached the point of, okay, this was normal, but now we're getting to the stage where we need to actually do something about it. Because I'm sure like if it's just happening a little bit, okay, that's fine, ignore it. But how do we know when we get to the point where we're like, okay, there's things we can do that will actually make a difference? Yeah, well, the thing is, as soon as you notice it, like there's always something you can do. You don't have to stay in a state where like, oh, I guess I'm just, you know, distracted, or I guess I can't keep on top of my tasks or, um, you know, this is, this is my new normal. If you notice that there is a level of dissatisfaction, if you know that, I almost call it this inner longing for more. It's like God gave you that. It's okay to want more in your life, to want more clarity, to want more um, substance, to want, to want more of your goals to be accomplished. Nothing's wrong with that. And so if you notice this level of dissatisfaction and frustration in your life, that's when you do something about it. Thing is, I don't want you to wait. Like, I don't want anyone to have to wait until it becomes so overwhelming that you're laying in bed like, my life is over, I can't do anything, someone else fold the laundry. Like, don't do that. Like, let's just, because that was me. Like, I totally, it took me having a mental collapse. I was so broke. I had, I have seven kids, but I just had a few kids at the time. I was out of shape, my house was cluttered. You name the problem. I had it. I was depressed. I had anxiety. Just took total collapse. And I remember laying there on the floor in my bedroom on top of about seven piles of laundry that I had intended to fold, but I just threw them on the floor. And just hating my life. I just, I just knew God created me for more. And I was so unhappy. And there I was ugly crying. And I clearly heard the voice of God deep within me because I was begging out, it's like, please, I need, I need help. I need someone to come in and help me get out of debt. I need, I need someone to come in and clean up my house. I need help getting back in shape. And he's like, he told me very clearly, stand up and fold your laundry. And that simple step, I did something radical. I actually was obedient. And from that point, God continually showed me how this new way of thinking works the biggest struggles that moms have and how to overcome them with the, with the power that he offers and with the guidance in his word. And out of that, it just started the snowball effect. So um, how, when do you know to do something about it? When you know that there's a level of dissatisfaction in your life, that's when you do something about it. I love that. And I love that you said, 
when you started to take those first steps to deal with it, it wasn't, okay, I need to go join a gym and go to the gym for an hour every single day. Okay, I need to go hire a nanny. I need to go clean my house from top to bottom and do all the things. It was, okay, get up, take the first step, fold your laundry, and then we will go from there. But you didn't have to start with this whole radical overnight change. Yeah. Well, well I couldn't afford to join a gym or hire a nanny, so... I was like, God met me right where I was, which he'll do for everyone. He will meet you right where you are and then take you further from there. So in your book, you talk about eight steps to overcoming mom fatigue syndrome. Can you share some of those with us today? Like what does your program wow. um, I would love to. It's kind of, well, it's kind of an incremental program, the mom mastery method. So you kind of have to start with square one, which is massive action. Um, and that's the part that a lot of us, we want to tiptoe into um, radical life change. Like we want to just take tiny little steps. And there's something to be said for little steps, but you have to do them with like 110% conviction. So when I decided, okay, I'm, I'm folding my laundry, it may have seemed like a small step, but I could have always gotten distracted. I've always, I could have always said later. But you've got to take massive action, not just action, but massive action where you kind of like burn the boats and say, no, I'm not going back to that. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to die trying. Like I'm, I'm going to create that life that God designed for me to live. And so we move from that point on through several steps and just basically all the way down to designing your day around the way your brain works. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried. Um, I mean, it may work for you. I know a lot of moms though, who try to do like day planners and they're made by people who are, do not have mom fatigue syndrome. They're made by people who actually can sit at a desk and have a lunch break and work for a solid 45 minutes without taking a break or, you know, having to take a break. And so they're made for that brain. And so sometimes when we try to do calendarizing that way or, or day planners that way we get so frustrated because like, okay, here's another day planner I used for two weeks in January and now I'm just going to add it to my stack. I must have a stack at least three feet high. And then I realized, oh wait, that doesn't work with the mom brain. So how can we organize our days now with a structure that will work for the way our brain operates? And I think that's truly why we're seeing such incredible success among the clients inside Mom Master University, because we all organize our days that way. So, and I mean, I got a, um, someone remarked today on the, on the uh, Facebook page, they were like, I don't even know who this woman is. It's 1030 AM and already I've got dinner in the slow cooker and the laundry's put away. Like, who is this woman? So it's, it's really incredible when you just start to, to really manage your environment around the way that God has designed you to work, things just happen. Yeah, I've seen that same thing in my life as well, where I follow a lot of like business advice kinds of things. And they're like, okay, let's figure out what your goal is. And here's your goal for the year. And then you just break it into 42 or 52, break it into 52 weeks. And then that week, like, okay, you're going to break it up into five. And then Monday, Tuesday, these are what oh, you lost me. And I'm like, that sounds wonderful. That makes total sense. Of course, you just divide it into chunks and Monday. But every time that I try this, I'm like, okay, Monday, I'm going to do this thing. And then the kid gets sick or the dog yeah. does something or I'm like that didn't happen it took longer than I was supposed to take on it and now like my whole plan is shot because I am off and like things don't fit into the boxes they're supposed to fit in so right. how do you deal with that well that's it's funny because you just described mom fatigue syndrome because we try to go back to the way um we could work our business or or work our home or meet our goals and it doesn't work and so something called learned helplessness actually sinks in we get this attitude where it's like well i tried i can't what's the point that's basically if you could like sum up what the phenomenon of learned helplessness is that's what it is and so a lot of moms struggle with like i tried diets i can't do it what's the point i tried to grow my business can't do it i'm just done i, I just can't do it anymore and so if we can start to work around our lives, our brains, our personalities, then we start seeing results. Like the way you described growing your business is like agonizing to me. And you lost me at break down your goals. Like, and, and the reason is because have you ever heard like that business advice of like, get one goal, put on your blinders, go after it. 
succeed, do the, okay, that might work for you, Mr. Businessman sitting behind your desk without kids running around and, you know, pooping in their pants. Moms can't do that. And so what we have to realize is if we get one goal and go after it with blinders on, okay, what happens to feeding the kids? What happens to the laundry? What happens to um, my involvement with church or my social network? I mean, it's just like, you, we don't have that option. And so sometimes moms will try to do it the typical way and, and they get so frustrated with themselves and they feel like a failure. And know this, whoever's watching or listening, you did not fail. The program failed you. Please understand that. There's nothing wrong with you. You are not broken. You're just doing it the wrong way. And so when we can start work around, okay, what do, how, do I set, how do I set goals in all areas of my life? How do I really turn these baby steps into routines that I practice on a daily level? And so when we start to do that, that's when things change and they change radically. Okay, so let me ask you. I'm thinking of a mom who has several children, small children, still at home. Her house is destroyed. She's like, I have no idea what we're doing for dinner tonight. I am overweight. I am broke. I am all of the things. And now you're telling me. So basically, you knew me. Like... <laughs> So now you're telling me, okay, I need to make massive action or even baby steps. How does she get started taking action when there are so many different things that she wants to change? She can't go all in on one going, you know, kind of in on eight things is maybe not going to make a difference. Where does she even get started? Wow. That's such a big question because there's certain processes that help you do that. I mean, I go really deep into it in the Mom Fog Challenge. We spent 28, 21 days breaking these steps out. Um, but I would say just that one step that you can do, and I call it tie a bow around it. Like if you can do one project and tie a bow around it, it could be as simple as, can I wash the dishes and put them all away? And that, the, like complete that small task. And sometimes it doesn't feel so small. But if I can complete it and tie a bow around it, what it does to your brain is we have a reward center in our brain that when you stimulate that reward center, then it's like, hey, I'm going to do this again. Problem is, we never complete tasks in order to stimulate that reward center because we have mom fatigue syndrome. So if we can just find one small task, complete it, tie a bow around it, our brain is like, gets that instant stimulation and now it's ready to do the next thing and so just that just that one thing can you wipe off your counters in the kitchen and congratulate yourself that you did it that one thing and it just looks so good i remember one time when my whole house i started in doing this process and my house was a wreck Brittany. like it was a wreck and i just did my linen closet my tiny little linen closet i pulled everything out put all back in. The kids were all underfoot. They were playing with the sheets and everything. We turned into a game. We played music. And then after that, I just wanted to open up the door and just stare into the linen closet the whole time. It was so exciting. Like I finally completed something. One mom, when she was doing the mom fog challenge, did her entire kitchen. She put away her dishes. She cleaned off the counter and she actually got a physical bow, Brittany. She tied a bow around her, her counter, posted a picture inside our Facebook group. She said, I did it. I tied a bow. And just being able to do that sometimes is that kick in the pants that your brain needs to say, wait, I can actually do this. What's next? Okay, so what do you say to the mom then who's like, okay, I can take a Tuesday night, I can take a Saturday morning, I can find a couple of hours or however long it takes, I can find one area of my house, I can clean it up, and I can tie a bow around it, and that's great. But what do you say to her when she's like, okay, I can do that, but two hours later, my children are coming in and destroying the whole thing, so what's the point of doing this if it's not going to stay done? Yeah, absolutely. I would say definitely get inside the mom fog challenge <laughs> because <laughs> if you even said I can do this in two hours, I would say, no, stop. No, do not do that. Because what happens is exactly that. The work is destroyed and then you're back where you started. What I would say is pick a very small task and go all in. I'm going to wipe off my counters every single night before I go to bed. Do that for seven days. 
And just, just that one thing, it'll give your brain enough repetition. So now you can turn the task into a routine. Now what that does to your brain is basically the front of your brain, like your, your does all the cognitive, like that prefrontal lobe does all the cognitive decision-making. So we have to put a lot of thought around it. Like, Oh, let me, let me clean off the counters. I think I'll do that. I think I'll get the cleaner and the rag. Okay. I can do that. We like do that decision-making after several days or weeks of doing that, it goes into what's called the reptilian brain. And so then it's just a habit. It's kind of like brushing your teeth in the morning. You don't put a lot of thought behind it. So now if you can transfer those tiny habits from the prefrontal lobe into base, you know, the basal ganglia, that reptilian brain, the primitive brain, now you have a habit. And so you start tiny little habits and those start accruing and you're able to accomplish more and more. I would never say set two hours, get it all done because number one, you're not going to finish it. And number two, it's going to be destroyed. Number three, you'll be back where you started. So that's why we work on the little steps and turn them into habits. And then we start, that's why it's an incremental program. And we just build upon that. That's something that I've been doing a lot of in my own life as well lately. I have so many, I mean, I feel like I'm doing good in some areas, but there's always like so much more that I want to do. And so I'm trying to think, okay, if I try to go all in on, I'm going to just eat super healthy and like clean eating all the things that's not going to happen. I might be able to do it for a day. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I'm going to be like, give me all of the Oreos because I'm just over this. That's too hard. But what I've been doing is, okay, how can I start with just something really small and do that for a week and make that into a habit. And then the next week we'll build on top of it. So for me, I love, um, binge eating cookies while I am writing because I just, that's just what I do. I've always done it for years. So I'm like, okay, this week I am going to start number one by eating a healthy breakfast every single day. Like I can do that. And then once I've done that, okay, maybe next week I am going to not have Halloween candy before 10 a.m. Um, and just like adding on that way. Is that a method that you would recommend? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because inside Mom Master University, when you get started with the different master tracks, you actually spend two weeks working on one simple thing. And, and that's it. Like, for example, if you're doing the fitness track, you want to lose weight, you want to get healthy, get your energy back. The first thing we do is we spend two weeks and the only habit we practice is drinking water every single day. And so we check that off. And then the next two weeks we drink our water and then we add something on top of that. And so that would, that's definitely what I would suggest is setting those things that you know will stretch you, but they're achievable. And when you practice doing that, like I, about two years ago, I was like, you know, I'm not going to eat any more refined sugar. I can do that. I can do that habit. And for two years, I haven't eaten any refined sugar. It's just like that little thing that I'm just going to make this a habit and turn this into my protocol. And then it becomes my lifestyle. I like how you're like, oh, this is just such a small thing for me. I could just not eat sugar. And I'm like, I would die. <laughs> okay, okay, so that's why we're different. And so we decide on what works for us. Yeah, I love that. So I want to switch gears a little bit because this topic of mom fog syndrome is obviously something that affects our parenting, obviously affects our ability to take care of our house. But let's talk about how it affects us spiritually because I'm sure it gets in the way of that as well. Oh, absolutely. Because we get frustrated. We don't, we think God's not coming through for us. And in all honesty, we're not coming through for ourselves. We're kind of trapped. It's funny because, um, if you are um, a grown adult, if you are dissatisfied with your life, if you're broke, you've already been brainwashed and manipulated into believing certain ideas about your life. So when we can start to change our ideas, when change our thoughts, and that's where we start. In the Bible, it says that we are to take every thought captive under the obedience of Christ Jesus. So if we can take our thoughts captive and first of all, become aware of them, and number two, learn how to change them around, and number three, learn how to make our thoughts a habit, then we're able to set off an entire network of events because the way we think becomes the way we feel. The way we feel becomes what we do. And then what we do creates the life that we live. So if we could just change our thoughts, think about it. If you tell yourself, I'm tired long enough, 
your body actually is going to release melatonin, it's going to um, release certain neurochemicals that make you tired. If you tell yourself, I am so excited, I have so much energy, I am so alive and vibrant, then all of a sudden you release different neurochemicals and then that changes your energy level. But the thoughts that we think become the words that we say. So if we can go back to the root, that's when we can change the fruit. I've noticed that as well. I had a conversation with some friends a while back and they were talking about dieting tips and all that kind of thing. And just a right, normal, weird conversation that we had. Um, but they were asking me, oh, well, we should ask your advice. Like, what do you do to stay thinner and not overweight? And I was like, you know, like I could tell you a bunch of like random tips, but for me, it all comes down to, I've always kind of been naturally thin. So that's how I see myself. That's the thoughts. That's the stories that I tell myself. And when I tell myself, Hey, I am somebody who is thin that I make decisions in line with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I don't know what's going on in your head, but to my friends, I'm saying, if you are constantly telling yourself in your head, oh, I'm such a fat pig. Oh, why are you doing that? Oh, of course you're doing that. And look at you and what you're doing. And I would say the same thing to anybody listening today. If you're telling yourself constantly, oh, I can't be a good mom. Oh, I can't keep up with the housework. Oh, I am doing these things. And that's how you see yourself. Then you're going to make decisions in line with that's who you think you are. But for me, it came down to first starting with, okay, this is who I am. I am somebody and deciding I am somebody who is this way and then making decisions out of that. That is so true because we listen to ourselves more than we listen to anyone else. Um, funny story about, not funny, but very powerful story. I have a client who came to me, I'm, I'm a life coach, and I have a client who came to me who had tried um, every diet, like I'm not gonna name them, but you know all the diets, online diets, um, where you go to meeting diets, all this kind of thing. She had gone to a hypnotherapist to lose weight. She was trying to get gastric bypass surgery insurance to cover that. She came to me, she was weighing 480 pounds. It was basically crushing one of her ankles. And she had, I, I, she really wanted to get insurance to cover. I said, can we just work together for six months? Just six months. And let's do things God's way and see if things change around. Do you know, she is currently still my client. She has lost over 250 pounds. And she was able to take something off her vision board. She called me crying. She said, I can't believe what I did today. I was like, tell me about it. She said, I went to the mall with my daughter and was able to walk around and shop. And that was like, some of us would be like, yeah, that's a big goal. Yeah, for her, it was huge because she could, she was immobile. And so now she was able to reach that goal. And I'm telling you, the one thing that changed that was most powerful was we had to create a set of proclamations that she said out loud to herself every single day. And do you know what's crazy is that since pandemic, she put on 40 pounds. And she called me, she's like, we need to start working together again because I'm gaining weight. And I was like, well, let's see what changed. What changed in that since pandemic? I said, did you still say your proclamations every single day? She's like, no, I stopped saying them. We have to continually train our brain to believe what we want to believe about ourselves. And the thing is, we, if we stop doing that, we just go back to those core beliefs we had when we were younger, and that starts to take authority over our lives. So the more we tell ourselves who we want to be, like, as if it's already done, it's like subconsciously, it just goes into effect. And I want to clarify what we're talking about a little bit here for people who are listening, because I want people to make sure that they realize we are not talking about manifesting things or calling things. People talk about this a lot, and it comes from the new age thinking, which is not Christian at all, where they're like, oh, I'm going to speak it into existence, and we're going to manifest all the things, and I'm going to say, and then the universe is going to know. Um, I just want to be very clear. We're not manifesting any of that. Instead, it comes down to saying, okay, this is what God says about me. I'm going to agree with what God says about me, and I'm going to say it in a declaration of believing and a declaration of faith. Like, yes, God says this about me. I'm going to say this about me so much until I believe it so that I live according to it. Not making something new happen. We're agreeing with what God already says. Yeah, so good. And you know what's funny is the law of attraction, like, I'm sorry, God came up with that. 
way before <laughs> there is a documentary or books or anything like that. But I call it the law of agreement because you're right. We just begin to agree with what God's word says about ourselves. And he even says like, let the weak say, I am strong. We are supposed to call those things that are not as if they already are. And when we start operating in that level of faith, as it, I mean, faith is the substance. That's what Hebrews 11 one says. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So even if we're not seeing our debt-free home, even if we're not seeing our vibrant, energetic body, we have to believe it as if it already is because God has his, he wants to bless us. And so he has a design for our bodies, for our money, for our homes, everything. And we start agreeing with what he says about us. And then that changes our mind. Just like I said, if you are in that place of desperation, you've already been brainwashed by the enemy to not believe and be in agreement with what God says about you. Very true. Well, before we wrap things up today, do you have any final closing thoughts, anything that you wanted to share and haven't had a chance to, but you want to make sure you say? I just want to reiterate again that um, we're not flawed. You're not flawed. Whoever's listening, you're not flawed. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not, um, you're not a basket case. You're not hopeless. I remember believing that for so long about myself. And then I realized, wait, no, there is always a fresh start. There is always a new beginning because God's mercy is new every morning. So this very moment could be the moment that you decide enough is enough. I'm stepping into that life that God wants me to live. That life that John 10, 10 says, a life of abundance to the full till it overflows. That's what he wants for you. And today, this moment can be the day that you decide to go after that. Absolutely. And to add on to that, if you say, okay, today I'm going to do it and you do it and tomorrow you fall off the wagon, get right back on because we all mess up with there's, I mean, there's so many times where I have wanted to set a goal or I wanted to do something. I fail all the time. And that doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means try again. What didn't work? Let's try again. Right. Love it, girl. You got it. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to share your wisdom with us. We, I really loved having you today. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. All right, so that just about does it for today's episode. If today's podcast episode really resonated with you and you are saying, yes, this is me, I feel like I cannot keep up as a mom, my brain is cloudy, I just am not being the mom that I want to be, I really encourage you to check out Hannah's book, Mom Fog, Eight Steps to Overcoming Mom Fatigue Syndrome. She also, like I said during the interview, has a quiz on the front of her website. That is a lot of fun too. So you can kind of see, okay, is this something that I'm dealing with? How bad is it? And you can find that right on hannahkeely.com. And as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? We come back here regularly to bring you inspiring interviews with Christian women who will help you be the amazing Christian woman, wife, and mother that God created you to be. So go ahead, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave us a review if you loved this episode and you love this show. And we will talk to you again real soon. All right, bye.